আরাত্রিকা হ্যাঁ বলো আমি রেকর্ডিংটা অন করে দিয়েছি দেখতেই পাচ্ছো হ্যাঁ আর শুরুটাও আমি করছি যদি কোনো প্রবলেম হয় তো একটু টেক ওভার করো ওকে 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 ঠিক আছে
জ্যোতির্ময় হ্যাঁ বলো স্যার জয়েন করেছেন দেখতে পাচ্ছি এ কে ম্যাম কি জয়েন করেছেন এ কে ম্যাম আমি বলছি ম্যাডাম কি আমি আবার জয়েন করছি হ্যাঁ you will join soon okay hello everyone this is abhay kumar rai faculty member at the department of english of malda college welcoming you all to the webinar and special lecture series 2021 this is supposed to be the third lecture of this series the title of which is memory nostalgia and the different retelling of the past in intizar husain's basti i would like to now request dr onuradha kunda honorable convener of the webinar and special lecture series to deliver the welcome note ma'am over to you thank you abhay good afternoon all um so this is the third webinar of the series and it's a hearty welcome to dr raja basu uh last year in our webinar raja was a speaker dr raja basu was a speaker and uh, we were rather mesmerized by his wonderful lecture so here we are once again i think the students will enjoy the lecture the faculty members are also there and i don't think that i shall take much time so dr raja basu i request you to deliver your lecture thank you all yeah thank you so much ma'am Uh, am i audible and visible both yes sir okay perfectly thank you. audible thank you so much thank you so much this has been a uh, I, i i don't know what to say i mean i'm so indebted to malda college to onuradha madam uh, to abhay to jyotirmoy everybody i mean for giving me this opportunity to speak for the second time that's uh, uh, my students don't want to listen to me uh, for uh, known reasons i mean they because they are my students uh, but uh, getting this opportunity and uh, to be very frank i am really not uh, a partition studies uh, person but uh, since this text was assigned to me uh, this year and uh, i had to prepare it for my students i'm uh, going with it and uh, given this opportunity i'm so uh, feeling uh, humbled i mean because uh, onurada madam calls me and i have no way to say no to her she is in fact a very good good great human being i just want uh, an iota of her uh, quality i mean in me uh, you people are all very fortunate to have her with you uh, and with that note i think i should begin uh, but i'll focus uh, specifically on basti and uh, keep things tied down because i don't want to go to the eastern frontier i mean uh, if you go to rikti ghatok and mega uh, thakasara and uh, Uh, other things i mean that becomes very a uh, difficult uh, zone uh, to handle i mean i stick to this uh, western frontier and uh, the division of uh, the uh, undivided india once into india and pakistan and much later 1971 into bangladesh 
so uh, I'll go with the introductory part, which is uh, a must thing. Uh, uh, I, I, the introduction is by Asif Faruqi, and what he has to say um, about Intizar Hussein is, uh, since this is a student-centric seminar, I think I have to touch the relevant points, uh, and I'll say a bit about uh, Intizar Hussein. Intizar Hussein was born in 1925. Uh, uh, is a journalist. I'll sip my uh, Cup, uh, is a journalist, a short story writer, and a novelist. Born in Dubai, Budanshar, in uh, British administered India, he migrated to Pakistan uh, in 1947 and lived in Lahore. Besides Basti, he is the author of two other novels, Nayaghar, The New House, very significant to its meaning, uh, which paints a picture of Pakistan during the 10 year dictatorship of the Islamic fundamentalist General Zia uh, and Aage Samandar Hai, uh, Beyond is the Sea, which juxtaposes the spiraling urban violence of contemporary Karachi with the vision of the lost Islamic realm of Al Andalus. Uh, there is a slew of a uh, collection of Hussein's celebrated short stories. I'm not naming them, uh, but I'll uh, reflect a little on the title of uh, the book. Uh, about which I'll go into details uh, very soon. Uh, Basti was published in 1979, uh, an Urdu word, Basti, uh, Basti means a colony, a settlement. Uh, it's not a nation as such, uh, an Urdu word that refers to a human settlement of any dimension from a few houses to a city. Uh, we see the world through the eyes of a child, which is very important. I mean, you can also have a question as uh, a post-colonial Bildungsroman. Uh, because it's seen through the eyes of a child and a child who grows up, Zaki who grows up into a professor of history. Uh, and uh, through his childhood, he uh, moves from different areas of uh, India and Pakistan, uh, from Rupnagar to Vyaspur and then to Shamnagar in Pakistan and then to Lahore. So it's a growing up of a child and quite an artistic growing up. So uh, even if we don't put him uh, into the Dickensian zone or the uh, Joycean zone, we can always have a different kind of a post-colonial approach uh, to Zaki's uh, growing up. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, from a few houses to a city, we see the world through the eyes of a child, and uh, it is a paradise of brightly colored birds. That is what Basti is. Uh, settlements are uh, in India, because we always uh, think about, about ourselves in the concept of a pala. Uh, we uh, are settled in a pala. Uh, we have few people or uh, a, a few few number of people whom we know, we interact uh, on a daily basis. But uh, of course, with the uh, growing culture of uh, having uh, flats and apartments, uh, this culture is also uh, becoming a, a little bit of a, uh, diluted. I mean, uh, and it is a paradise of brightly colored birds, playful animals, and luscious greenery, which we had in our childhood. I remember my uh, growing up in Pala, I used to play cricket on the road and we used to cross one another to another house and there were uh, places from where we could creep into one another's house. Uh, and it, 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 it was kind of a really a beautiful growing up because we, we had food in one another's home. I mean, that is the kind of an essence which perhaps um, Basti is also trying to say uh, or Intazar Hussain is trying to give us. Uh, that Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs were not different. They lived together, and the together living was uh, of a different kind. They used to share the same culture, the language, uh, the clothes, the food that was similar. Uh, not, of course, the religious part. I mean, uh, religiously, they were strung together, but in a very loose way. Uh, it was more uh, on the cultural basis they were together. And that is why when partition happened, these people uh, suffered from a kind of a uh, diffused uh, identity crisis, I mean, uh, which uh, we can say in the Ericksonian term, uh, a diffused identity. They couldn't integrate themselves. And that's why it, it was a more kind of a psychic disorder or psychic trauma, uh, which uh, was generated among the people who actually crossed the border. So I will get into those details later on. Uh, this paradise, however, proves to be short lived. Soon Zakir, the <clears throat> protagonist and narrator of the book, is cast into a world of violence uncertainty and longing, the world of 
modern Pakistan because uh, these people were promised that once they cross the border, they go to their brethren who belong to the same religion, they will have a different kind of a living. It, it is a kind of a promised land uh, to which they will be and uh, they will get all sorts of facilities. But it was a, a, a kind of a dissolution for them once they reached Pakistan. Uh, and Basti perhaps is uh, the best thing, best, best place uh, where we get to know uh, what happened? Uh, you see, the other novel that you have, The Train to Pakistan, Train to Pakistan by Kushwan Singh, there at least these details are not uh, given. Uh, those are about partition, what happened during partition and uh, that kind of a story we are getting into. But uh, here we know what happened post partition. And uh, this is a different kind of a storytelling altogether. And that's why I have in my title this different kind of a storytelling or uh, account about the past. Uh, which is not a very normal kind of a, neither it's a kind of a linear narrative, uh, neither it is only just about uh, moving from India to Pakistan, but it goes back once to 1857 and it tries to reconnect 1857 to 1947 and jumps into 1971. So these are the three uh, areas, three uh, time spans which are being connected. And uh, apart from that, there is also the mythic reference about Kufa, Damascus, Jerusalem, these places come into. And these are all totalitarian states and Pakistan, what has happened to Pakistan now, or in general, what uh, the condition of any totalitarian state uh, might be, is being discussed and shown through a very mythic angle. So uh, mythology, uh, mythology comes into play in this way that it kind, kind of creates uh, a, a, a pattern of of events, events which are extremely recurrent. And in that way, we can say that it's a mythic retelling of uh, of life, of partition and post-partition life and before it. So uh, uh, after that, I think I should uh, go into what nostalgia is, because the title is uh, dealing with nostalgia. So uh, nostalgia has two root words. One is nostos for my students. Uh, others know more than me. Uh, Nostos is returning to home, uh, the desire to return to home, and ailos, A-I-L-O-S, which is pain or sickness. So nostalgia means full of regret over a lost culture and a betrayed tradition. Mm. So mm, this is a kind of homesickness for the pre-partition days. After being fooled by the politicians and fanatics, uh, over the religious face of politics. They soon find these people, the refugees or Sharanarthis, or uh, whom we call Mohajirs. Mohajirs, if you watch Sarfarosh, you, most of you have, must have seen, Nasiruddin Shah is playing that role of a Mohajir. Uh, and he is pretty disgusted with the events that had happened to them once they had crossed border. So he is uh, revengeful on India for that reason. Uh, so uh, these people will be fooled by politicians and fanatics over the religious face of politics. This, uh, these refugees soon find themselves that uh, such identities do not matter. Religious identities for which they had went, uh, uh, they had gone over to Pakistan or those people who had moved into Bangladesh or uh, from Bangladesh, uh, so to say, uh, those uh, Bangals, which we actually are, uh, had come to live with the Ghotis. Uh, so a kind of marginalization that did happen then. And these people also, as Mohajirs, uh, face the same problem in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, where such identities do not matter, what they needed was shelter and work which they were promised that once you go over there, it's a kind of a paradise. You go over there and you will find work, you will find every other thing. Uh, as they had been reduced to mere Sharanarthis, as I said, refugees who knew uh, pilgrimage is only to the refugee welfare office. Uh, so they had to go and make a beeline to the refugee welfare office. They had to show their uh, papers. Most of them had left their homes back and had uh, thought about uh, as a temporary madness that this phase of temporary aberration would end and they would be able to go back to their homes once more. And this kind of a madness won't last long. So didn't uh, they kept their homes locked and as if they had gone to a pilgrimage or uh, as we visit to some other place, maybe to Nainital or uh, any other place and come back, uh, we leave uh, things as it is. We don't uh, take that much of care about things. Uh, that we are going to come back. So that is what thought was uh, with them. But once they went uh, to Pakistan or they came over to India from Bangladesh or from uh, Pakistan to India, 
uh, they had to face these refugee camps and there were refugee welfare offices where they had to go and uh, they had to search for spaces for homes uh, they had become homeless and initially uh, those people those people who came in groves in kafilas and or in caravans uh, they occupied those spaces and then uh, initially they had a uh, lot of space in their own mind to uh, give shelter to their own brethren who are coming from the other side of the border but gradually that space narrowed down and uh, they became uh, more uh, more obsessive about their own space and they wanted to occupy it uh, and those people who were actually homeless got big mansions over here and those people who had big mansions over there uh, had left their uh, rooms to disuse and uh, uh, there had grown forests uh, which we find in basti those people come over here and they find that they are practically shelterless uh, so this was the more or less the condition of the people and they had to make a bee line over there at the refugee offices and they had to bribe uh, uh, the officials over there which uh, is being called the wheel and deal over here they had to uh, grease their palms of the officers and uh, to get a, a small house uh, in exchange of their bigger homes which they had left back though they had always thought that they would be able to go back so uh, uh, kind of uh, see uh, this also has a kind of a mental uh, aspect to it psychic aspect extremely related to this um, in basti um, actually i don't want to go into my paper i would like to Uh, say um, the way i'm saying uh, i i feel more better saying this way but since it's for the students i think um, i should go into a more organized way uh, i have written a paper and i'll go to but i'll uh, take these uh, other routes make the detours at times uh, so the uh, name of the paper is memory nostalgia and a different retelling of the past in intezar hussein's pasti uh, i think i have uh, uh, how much time do i have Sir, yes, you can speak. Okay. You can speak. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank no you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I I will then read out my paper. Just uh, students, please, please follow me. Uh, I think it will benefit you. Uh, I I think. Uh, the very title Basti. Uh, this is uh, the first segment is on title. The very title Basti or settlement is an anathema to the notion of country, which is a new uh, or you might say a recent Western formulation. The notion of desh after Anjali Gera Roy. Uh, has been contested has been a contested term in the subcontinent uh, where it stands for one's own original home so desh stands for home uh, so uh, keep that in mind that nation is not just desh desh mane tomar desher bari kothay once uh, you are staying in uh, say uh, uh, amriti or say in uh, shahapur or uh, i was teaching in pakuhat so uh, uh, or hobipur uh, you come to malda and people will ask you tomar desh kothay you have an apartment in malda but when people ask you uh, in english bazar uh, or in uh, rothbadi or mongolbadi je tomar desh kothay then you say it's in uh, hobitpur uh, so this is the thing that happens that desh is a, a very contested term in our country or in the subcontinent thus compared to the nation which is a larger entity based on citizenship and homogeneity on the basis of one's religion or other common features as yanendra pande discusses uh, the notion of a settlement of the colony uh, however is temporary and heterogeneous uh, i am referring to the sikh muslims and hindus staying together so it's a heterogeneous kind of a, uh, staying together where the people uh, staying in a particular place are loosely bound by a kind of group affinity based on cultural similarity and hence the nation comprises of not a monolithic voice but multiple voices that is what ganendra pandey says uh, in the pre partition times people uh, hindus muslims and sikhs used to live together in strong cultural bonding though loosely strung on the basis of religion in ice candy man by babsi sidwa uh, thus we find the people in the village think that both the muslims and sikhs are brothers uh, mark this place because they are all jats so in the rural belt though there are strange events happening in the city in the rural rural belt people uh, feel in the countryside that we are one because hindus and muslims are or uh, muslims and sikhs who are living over there uh, are bound by uh, their notion that they are all jat brothers so that's a different kind of a caste identity that comes in and binds them together it's not a religion 
the shift of say a uh, hindu from pakistan or from any western province province of india to any part of india would definitely create cultural problems since the culture in bengal odisha or any southern province uh, should be definitely different from that on the western frontier say punjab for example so i'm referring to yashpal's novel uh, jhuta sach where uh, this protagonist who had once been transferred to katak actually finds the clothes of the women also kind of aberration their food different see he is a hindu but once you displace these people from pakistan to south india perhaps a hindu in punjab is more close to a muslim in punjab or a sikh in punjab they are all punjabis we need to understand this and when this hindu is displaced to odisha or maybe to south india uh, he goes amongst hindus but he finds it difficult i mean the cultures don't match so it's a more kind of a cultural affinity we need to remember it's not about religion uh, basti too shows uh, uh, to shows the cultural similarity of the people of the two nations that separated them by dint of the drawing of a radcliffe line uh, and the whims of the national leaders at the end displaced from their own homelands and uh, though living among people of the same religion they still uh, found themselves marginalized as sharanarthis or muhajirs searching for work and shelter which i had already said uh, so what happens this is uh, about a cultural inheritance the taj the poems of meer and galib though of different eras meer and galib were from different eras steep the imagination of the populace irrespective of their religion so those people who now uh, go to pakistan and say they are pakistanis actually initially they called them ambalis and karnalias from karnal haryana ambalis from ambala uh, so these kind of provincial identities uh, were more important to them than the national identity of being uh, a pakistani or a muslim or whatever i mean you cannot divide uh people on the basis of fuzzy border lines because they have this cultural inheritance the taj belongs to every other person one who is in pakistan also has an inheritance of the taj uh, or uh, the poems of meer and galib they are steeped their imaginations are steeped in those uh, what you call the the, the, the fluid the rasa uh, of those poems thus on the second occasion uh, when bangladesh earned its freedom even then the person who had planned there is a specific reference to a person who had planned to escape from bangladesh to india took shelter or refuge in someone's household and watched pakistan pakiza and meena kumari this is a 1971 film see bangladesh happened in 1971 16 december and uh, this person who was supposed to uh, cross the border go to pakistan and they had no other way some went into burma some uh, went to towards nepal and those who came into india became prisoners because now they are pakistanis they they do not belong to pakistan they, which has now uh, become bangladesh and so this is a kind of a second partition for them and they are now going back uh, and once they come into india uh, some pakistanis uh, who actually uh, were in bangladesh uh, uh, desire to stay back because they were in love with the films of india so it's a kind of a cultural affinity uh, they they fell in love with pakiza uh, with meena kumari uh, and kept on delaying his plans to leave for pakistan and every day uh, watched the movie I could model work uh, till out of fear of being caught by the police he had to be in india uh, reach amritsar and then cross the border into pakistan in 1942 and later on when there were riots in india and zakir and surender surender is zakir's hindu friend returned from vyaspur station to khirki bazar they are returning from the same college uh, from meerut uh, where the roads diverged to their separate settlements so the roads have now become fogged on the road they found the jagat hall ravaged bricks lying all around with torn posters of kanun devi this is once again in 1947 so uh, this kind of a cultural lineage is always there kanun devi and meena kumari uh, and films these bind people of both the nations in 1947 too the people who came to pakistan uprooted from their soils turned into muhajirs and we find in sleep walkers by joginder paul for a sure read you must read this novel uh, sleep walkers uh, how the people carried the entire lakhnow i have been to lakhnow our mashidwari okane lakhnow hazratganj these are the places i have been and uh, joginder paul is referring to them aminabad and anarkali market uh, and the mahilabadi mangoes of lakhnow and these people uh, who have uh, come over from lakhnow to karachi and who speak pure urdu and that is what discriminates them from the native 
uh, um, Karachi people because native people don't uh, speak so uh, well Urdu and they have this uh, very very spruced tongue I mean for Urdu uh, those people who are coming from Lakhno <coughs> sorry uh, and um, uh, they actually bring over the entire Lakhno into Karachi we find the entire Lakhno in front of us because people do inherit the Taj and their home places they have a nostalgia and longing for it as I was giving you the description of uh, Nostros and uh, Eilos, uh, which means a, a kind of homesickness, a sickness for a place which one has left. And uh, opposed to it, there is this word uh, term called hyperamnesia. Hyperamnesia is about uh, the kind of, uh, you might say, uh, traumatic disorders in the mind, which is the other spectrum of uh, nostalgia. Uh, traumatic disorders in the mind, which is caused owing to displacement and the violence that people actually undergo going to uh, partition. Uh, that is also one thing which is there in the minds of the people. And if you uh, follow Joginder Paul's other uh, novel, I mean, uh, novel means, I mean, uh, short story, Dera Baba uh, Nayak. Mm. <clears throat> Let me tell you a bit of, uh, about the story. It's, it's since a psychic um, place, and uh, you might be able to refer it to this, uh, uh, this answer of Pasti uh, that, uh, there you find a caravan, which is uh, kafila, as I was saying, and those kafilas were very long, very long kafilas, mm, uh, crossing from one country to the other border. And uh, there you have a madman, and the kafila is made, uh, there is first the cows heading, then uh, there is mm, mm, uh, the Hindu refugees, then there is the children, then the aged, then the middle-aged people. And this is how the kafila moves. Uh, and mm, there's a madman. Who, and this is recounted by <coughs> you know, the narrator, who is actually after 50 years, who has reached Dera Baba Nayak, which is a small village from Shialkot in Pakistan. And he is narrating this, that he still has this dream, this gaulish uh, nightmare, uh, where he sees that uh, there's a madman who is uh, unzipping his uh, pajama strings, and he's uh, crying at times that he is a Hindu. At times he's saying, no, I'm a Muslim. So he, he doesn't know what, what to say. He's a lunatic. See, the lunatic uh, a person who uh, sees this and he finds a dismembered body and he's trying to put that together. So once he puts it together, it takes a Frankensteinian uh, form, a kind of a monster. Uh, this is the monster that was created metaphorically because of partition. Uh, that you need to keep in mind. There are several metaphors, metaphors of madness, there's this metaphor of uh, a monster. There's also this metaphor of um, uh, the tailoring, which goes very well because the earth was cut. So it's a woman's body which is being cut. So uh, I, I'll get to that poem also, uh, which is Kazar Huck's Border, uh, where you will find that uh, how the woman's body is cut and sutur, and um, uh, people who were traveling by trains were stabbed at very close quarters, and their uh, bodies were also had to be tailored. So. Uh, this is a big metaphor, which uh, the earth is being torn apart, it is being soon, uh, and uh, what happens is a kind of a monstrous thing that comes out, or the kind of a childbirth, which is related to the mother's body and this tailoring uh, metaphor. Uh, the child we get is not a very healthy child and out of partition. So these are other aspects, and I get back to the story, uh, Dera Baba Nayak, and uh, we find that... Uh, there, uh, when he is actually this lunatic person is trying to uh, figure out uh, this uh, dismembered figure, uh, uh, the, the monstrous thing that it becomes, uh, people, uh, he uh, somehow wakes up and he realizes at the end of his dream that the entire caravan, why he has this dream, is uh, somehow being led by this lunatic man. Uh, once you name this lunatic man, immediately another story comes to your mind. It is Mantos Tovatexi, uh, who dies on that uh, undecided territory. And this lunatic man is actually leading the entire caravan backwards towards Shialkot, not to Dera Baba Nayak. So uh, there is this high chance that they will all get killed uh, once they get into Pakistan. So this is the, the nightmare of opposite journey. Now, what happens about the train to Pakistan? What happened then with those people? Then Jagga trying to save uh, Nuran and all those Muslims at the end of train to Pakistan. We need to uh, get this into that this is more a kind of a psychic thing. 
uh, not a very usual thing which the uh, politicians decided the religious fanatics decided that people should go over there this uh, just get across the border it's really not that easy what happens is that what they leave behind that is one thing and the other thing is the kind of uh, traumatic disorder that they carry with them uh, is also one of concern and that's why we find that uh, the figure of zakir is you no know, normal figure he is actually a kind of a uh, who night walks the city the entire city he is walking through the entire city you might call him a flanu because he is a very artistic fellow uh, but this kind of a disorder happens because of alienation and displacement uh, <clears throat> so uh, in basti too the rumors make their uh, rounds uh, as i said about i was saying about the uh, entire lucknow coming into karachi and uh, this divane malvi sahab in uh, sleepwalkers is kind of a cranked fellow who thinks that he is still in lucknow um, in basti too the rumors make their rounds that agra had fallen and the taj destroyed but uh, this might have been a cause for celebration for many uh, uh, but surely not for all at least not for zakir's father uh, who had been in uh, rupnagar and vyaspur of india as much as in shamnagar and lahore in pakistan uh, am i audible hello hello yes sir yes, yes sir you are perfectly audible, audible. okay um but i think the uh, i mean audio video clip is stopped uh, a father who had been in uh, a cause for celebration for many but surely not for all at least not for zakir's father who had been in rupnagar and vyaspur of india as much as in shamnagar and lahore in pakistan thus the sense of nationalism is very difficult to develop uh, in the displaced people who have uh, owed more to a single settlement or to many from time to time habituated to a kind of living where the immediate surroundings become more important than the notion of a nation which is always an imaginative formulation uh, based on the notion of citizenship uh, and um, uh, it tries to give a kind of a homogeneous order to things which is not a very normal thing uh, this generates a natural kind of uh, alienation in the hero of the text that is zakir who roams the road of lahore as i was saying during his night walks a bizarre city where people hardly recognize each other and are unknown uh, i can uh, give a reference to a novel i mean shahar uh, nahi ghoga i cannot remember the name of the author if anyone can help uh, not a city but a shell where uh, all these people who have come into the city are uh, displaced and no one knows other there is no one to uh, no not a single shoulder on which you can lay your head and cry and go and tell your worries that is what is happening in our also uh immediate surroundings the flags are coming up we hardly know uh, people uh, those uh, the faces which we are habituated to this generates a natural kind of alienation in the hero of the text that is zakir who roams the roads of lahore during his night walks a bizarre city which people hardly recognize where people hardly recognize each other and are unknown the imperial hotel gets converted into the fake taj mahal which such as that the people of pakistan have not been able to forget the original the history adhered to either the taj or the fights during the sepoy mutiny or the struggles of 1947 history is conjoined to culture and collective experiences mm, and hence is mutual the pain of border crossing sense of alienation and the desire to return to one's own homeland known spaces is a deep study of the text Uh, the weight of sabira sabira uh, the word comes from the word sabr that is patience uh, who is also called a sabbo uh, for zakir in delhi and sabira and zakir had their relationship as most of you must be knowing since uh, you must have read the text uh, and uh, waits uh, for zakir uh, she is the maulvi's daughter who picks up a job as a journalist in delhi and since zakir had promised that once she will come back uh, she waits her entire lifetime and at the end when surinder is writing a letter to zakir he says that uh, there is in the parting of uh, sabira's hair there is a silver hair he can see and all their tufts i mean the male people surinder zakir irfan um, salamat and all those friends their uh, tufts of hairs are going silver day by day and um, uh, so time is very less time is going by i mean um, that's why surinder is calling zakir very cruel that you are making this girl wait for you and you are still in pakistan to come over to delhi and she is still waiting for you uh, so this becomes a, a, a 
see uh, the entire metaphor is there is another metaphor about uh, border longing and desire uh, the the other side of the border is seen as a woman a woman who is always waiting for you and you need to return to your love uh, kind of the hyacinth girl you might say of eliot uh, who waits with those wet hairs and hyacinths in her hand and who is blind and there's you know about tyrosis and all uh, this is kind of a waiting of sabira is also uh, uh, the kind of a longing for the homeland that one feels when one crosses border and comes to the other side even then one is always um, feeling that one should go back uh, you have seen i guess garam hawa you should see there's this old lady in garam hawa who is also penchant for uh, the ancestral home though she is staying in the same mohalla but she wants to go back to that home uh, where she had come in her teens as a married girl Uh, so she wants to die uh, in that house, and she doesn't want to quit. And that is the love for the land. Similarly, mm, uh, okay, um, Taj, yes, uh, into fake Taj, which suggests that the people of Pakistan have not been able to forget the original, the history adhered to either the Taj or the fights during the Sepoy mutiny or the struggles of 1947. History is conjoined through culture and collective experience, and hence is mutual. The pain of border crossing. sense of alienness and a desire to return to one's own homeland known spaces is a deep study of the text the weight of sabira for zakir in delhi or hakim ji's reluctance to leave one's ancestors shaded burial with neem trees is owing to a love for one's own home and soil so the sikhs were unwilling to leave their shrines and the muslims their ancestors graveyards which were uh, covered by leafy neem trees and they, they grew very green in monsoons in india and so one did not have to look for neem trees which happens with uh, afzal and um, zakir once they come to uh, pakistan they are searching for neem tree because neem tree uh, is from where they had their swings and they uh, swung on it uh, so they remember the neem trees uh, with a kind of a passion mm. and of course he has his own uh, love interest uh, because with uh, sabira zakir used to swing on those neem trees and so afzal's uh, uh, grandmother's intermittent questions whether the flood waters have receded or not and the desire to return home are about not about countries but for known roots spaces to which people uh, were tied with simplicity commonality of everyday experience that made the place once quote unquote home uh, so we have uh, two more references immediate uh, suraya khan's five queens road and where we find dina lal who gets converted to islam which we also have with urvashi butalia's uh, the other side of silence there you also have uh, urvashi butalia saying about her own maternal uncle um, who uh, actually gets converted because of the love of the land uh, he doesn't quit pakistan and doesn't wish to come over to india um, and uh, he stays back and uh, even with dina lal uh, who gets converted to islam and he is reluctant to leave lahore which has become a mad city uh, he gets even stabbed and then what he does he converts him, himself to islam and stays back in pakistan this is what happens uh, with the love of the land see the religion is minor thing in front of it uh, and there is fikr tonsri's chatta darya chatta darya is uh, the sixth uh, river Uh, the five rivers of punjab and the sixth river is the river of blood uh, so it's called the chatta darya shows how jagdish is willing to leave lahore for multan because lahore has become a mad city and he wants to quit multan and he wants to sell off his positions for a mere rupees 100 and then mm, uh, uh, tonsvi is actually asking him mm, mm, i cannot remember his pseudonyms it uh, is ramlal bhatia yes is ramlal bhatia and uh, he asks how can one sell the waves of ravi uh, the shitala mandir the shrine and its idol can it be sold the furlongs of uh, the entire punjab or uh, lahore uh, where one has grown up one cannot leave that land behind what price would uh, uh, would be of that land that piece of land it's very difficult to gauge and uh, so um, uh, these people uh afzal's grandmother or uh, whatever i was saying uh, they are tied with simplicity commonality of everyday experience that made the place once home people fail to realize the significance of the fuzzy border lines uh, like mantos hero in tobatek singh uh, what mattered was the space they inhabited 
and have built through mutual particip participation and love. Uh, I go to the second part, uh, which comprises of memory, nostalgia, space, and solitary walks. Uh, these are issues uh, essentially related to the narrative pattern, storytelling, border crossing, topography, and desire. I wish to read uh, this poem to you because I love uh, this one, uh, which is, um, let me find it. Up. Yeah, mm, uh, which was about this metaphor about a uh, border, and I was saying that the tethering metaphor is used. Uh, this is Kaiser Huck's border, where he is saying, uh, which features in the graphic novel by Vishwajati Ghosh, uh, where mm, this uh, so, mm, small poem is, uh, let us say you dream of a woman. Just think about the other side of the border as the woman uh, longing for longing for Sabira, Zaki is longing for Sabira. Uh, and because she isn't anywhere around, imagine her across the border. But instead of crossing over, you lie dreaming. You don't go. Zaki doesn't go to the other side of the border, but he lies dreaming of the woman and the border. Perfect knife, tailoring metaphor, uh, that slices through the earth without the earth's knowing. That is, earth does not know when it was partitioned, the directive line was wrong. Uh, the woman's body during childbirth partition, Pakistan is being given birth to the new nation. Uh, without the earth's knowing, Severs and joins at the same instant. You lie down on the fateful line under a livid moon, angry moon. Uh, you and your desire and the border are now one. You raise the universal flag of flaglessness. So, Tagore's nation nationalism, universal flag of flaglessness amidst bird anthems. So, what people are familiar with more is not about the borderline, but the birds' anthem, the quails. A song, the bulbul singing, these are the things, the neem trees, this is what people search actually, where one has grown up, one gets that comfort zone, uh, and it's where dawn explodes in a lusty salute. So uh, there is this mixing of self, desire, border, all become one, and uh, leads to a transcendental kind of a perception. Mm, this is uh, what Kaiser Huck's border is all about. So I get back to the paper. What happens in the process is that these events and spaces get jumbled up. Uh, the notion of time to is integer to this sense of a lost world of world uh, utopia. I think I should hurry a little. Uh, Rupnagar stands for aeons uh, or slow time or mythic time, which is marked by a composite culture, a composite or synthetic culture, which I had also discussed in my uh, last webinar uh, over here. Uh, so uh, uh, there is slow time, it's time as it does not move uh, in Rupnagar, and the living based on togetherness of all religions. Primarily the Hindus and the Muslims, the time is immovable. Every time electricity tries to enter, it fails as the light posts lie under heaps of dust. Abbajan, who is Zaki's father, keeps resisting this process of modernization of Rupnagar. Mm. With electric lights trying to enter the mosques, few monkeys are sacrificed when electricity does enter. The slow coming of evening was uh, previously ma rather marked by the lighting of lamps. The world too is mythic um, or idyllic with assumptions of the stripes on the body of the squirrels uh, in the first, very first page, who helped Ram to build the bridge uh, to be actually the fingerprints of Lord Rama. Uh, the rain on the night of Janmashtami is thought of as the heavens washing Lord Krishna's diapers. So beautiful. Uh, in as much as these, there are the original myths of the Quran and how those sayings from Quran take on an incantatory nature in the narrative. The existence of the stories told by Bhagatji, uh, on one hand, resides perfectly safely with Abba Jan's saying from Quran because life became very unsafe later on. So as long as there was this uh, composite culture, synthetic living, everything resided very safely. Uh, the existence, uh, okay. Uh, there is reference to the kite sitting on the parapet or the ledge of the town hall, who knows for how many years. And it seems uh, it has been ages. At the end, where there is chaos, when Zakir is on his way to his father's graveyard, he sees a kite with a carrion uh, flesh uh, in its mouth. Uh, there has been a hail of bullets on the mall road. The same kite in the very first uh, segment, and the kite we find now, uh, signifies a different time through its symbolic ruthless self. So 
time has changed so from creation we have moved moved to doomsday and there is a prediction of doomsday um, in pakistan yeah, even the lighting of the lamps in roopnagar suggested the boundary line between day and night when the wearied man returned home everything was beautiful see the lighting of lamps electricity did not come uh, people used to light lamps and there was wasanti uh, zakir's childhood love uh, and later on it was uh, sabira of course uh, and this lighting of lamps and uh, when the wearied man returned home he always tried to return before those lighting of lamps ekono tai hoy na parai manush fitte chay barite fitte chay alor jolar age sondhe bewar age ei je ferari those were markers uh but with war everything changed i'll come to it uh, you you straight away glide into night and pitch darkness uh from daytime there's no no marker electricity lights are off because of curfew and because of war because of night bombings uh so uh, those things just evaporated even the lighting of the lamps in roopnagar suggested the boundary line between day and night when the wearied man returned home later when cities were built after a day long journey the travelers and caravans wished uh, wished to enter the settlements uh, walls before dusk tokhono shei chesta dei korte to enter the settlements and the city before dusk before it's late uh, and see what happens with uh, kafilas and displacement this same thing is happening to people who are traveling for miles see uh, um, around uh, 5.2 million uh, hindus uh, had to um, uh, come over to india from pakistan uh, and 5.8 muslims went over to pakistan which was a huge number i mean 1 million man lost lakh uh, 10 to 15 million lost homes so um, and 1 million were killed uh, innumerable raped abducted uh, if you read urvashi butalia's uh the other side of silence or um, i mean borders and boundaries by uh uh ritu menon and kamla bhasin uh, even there you will find these anecdotes uh, in, uh which are memoirs because basti also tries to go away with the totalitarian documented kind of the history and uh, gets into this memoir mode about people saying their own stories narratives uh, so uh, war pronounced that there was no such border line uh there was just darkness no particular pattern and long nights as electric lights remain switched off during war and curfew and the kafilas which was i was trying to say that uh, basti also refers to these kafilas or caravans and trying to enter the settlement and see what happens during partition there is a long 52 mile and in chaman nahar in azadi is referring to a 75 mile long caravan or kafila Uh, of people and as i was also referring to uh, dera baba nay uh, there were around 30 to 40 thousand people and later on it grew up swelled up to 4 lakh people and uh, safety was in always in numbers because uh, there was marauders there were uh, abductors and, and there were people who actually changed the madness was also in the mind of the men uh, who actually made use of the situation sold women their own women uh, for money Uh, these things uh, were happening and uh, the government the uh, people who were given uh, the responsibility to look after them were completely apathetic after a certain point of time and when these people came to those camps uh, as refugees they had neither food nor shelter in a single day uh, the people who came with cholera uh, with one syringe 500 people were injected uh, the camp near lal kila so this was happening there were no nurses no doctors nurses and doctors had fled hindu nurses and doctors had fled pakistan mm, and um, you see uh, from the uh, close by tailoring shops uh, the pieces of clothes uh, i mean scissors all were uh, taken from those shops and used uh, to sew the wounds and it, it was that costly i mean uh, there is a search for such spaces which hold once childhood and become a conduit of memories beat roopnagar for zakir vyaspur for surender where love for rimchim had burgeoned or even the house in shamnagar from where on the first night after coming from india to pakistan zakir had mourned for vyaspur in india the sound of a bomb startles zakir as he fears that it might have destroyed shamnagar in garam hawa to as i was mentioning we find the old lady like afzal's grandmother Afzal's grandmother is the person who had been 
uh, moved to Pakistan uh, during riot, but she was told that there is a flood going on. So uh, she is throughout her entire lifetime, she is asking, had the flood waters recited, can I go back to my home? Uh, similar to uh, Thamma in uh, Amitabh uh, the shadow lines, uh, Dhaka Kothai. She goes back and she is still searching for Dhaka. Dhaka is no more the same as she had left. Uh, so this is a kind of disillusion then that happens with people who still uh, fondly look back to their own home, Desh, in Bangladesh and go back and don't find the same. Uh, uh, or even if we tend to go back to our own Pala or home, we don't get it. Uh, Mohalla, since she had come to the house uh, as a newlywed when she was young and in her teens, thus the notion of slow time and the romanticism involved with it is being thwarted and projected against the fast life of Lahore and Zakir's night walks as a Benjaminist uh, flanur. Uh, it began with Rupnagar where life was unhurried, uh, bullock carts wobbled their way on non-concrete non roads, there was plague when people left for Danpur. In Vyaspur, there are cars, gradually the, the speeding up of things. There are cars, horse-driven carriages, and even rail lines, suggestive of fast life, which uh, you people must be uh, remembering from uh, Guide, uh, because the rail line always suggested that same thing in Malgudi as well. Uh, in Vyaspur, there are cars, horse-driven carriages, and even the rail line suggestive of fast life. It is from the terrace of his, own, uh, from his home that he and Sabbo dream of a future life together in Delhi, while dropping her back home to Rupnagar after they had crossed the bazaar full of wasps and a smoke where jaggery was being made, his and Sabbo's hand touched one another. So it's a very romantic kind of a thing. He had felt the softness of her hands. The book he had promised to bring for her was Shaher's Paradise on Earth, quite ironically named Paradise on Earth. Uh, but they never meet as the riots had already begun. Uh, when he returned from his college in Meerut. Uh, so later on, he, he's planning at the end of the novel that he wishes to go back to Dilbi and meet Sabira. Uh, the next space is Lahore. Lahore is altogether different. There is the Shiraz, where he and his uh, group of friends, where he means uh, Zakir and his group of friends, including Irfan, Salamat, Ajmal, Zawar, and Afzal meet. The personal narrative of the man with white hair uh, who sits in that cafeteria called Shiraz, uh, whose entire head turned white after he reached Pakistan, is testimony to the harrowing experience one has to undergo while crossing borders. So these are the small narratives which come up and are kind of counter narratives which are challenging the totalitarian narratives of uh, history. Uh, 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 it is in the Shiraz that they give shelter to the refugees in 1947 who could not find space in Pakistan as corruption was rife, real and deal, uh, bribery. Uh, those who had their own mansions even thronged in the Shiraz, seeing the misery all around, Zakir and Irfan took long walks from the Shiraz down the mall road and at the end of the bridge uh, where they used to sit, they found the people tree that had been hewn. So, with the trees, we have a close connection, whether it be the neem tree or the people tree uh, or the tree uh, in Shamnagar where the bulbuls had come and had made their nest, uh, which actually reminded Ammi Jan about her own shelterless condition. Uh, 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 okay. uh, those who had their own mansions, okay, uh, find the mall road, uh, the different bazaars of Lahore, of Yaspur or Dildi become one at the end. Uh, <clears throat> the Jahangir garden, Nazira's shop from where Zakir used to buy cigarettes and the lanes and by lanes of Lahore are a part of his regular itinerary and offers a kind of spatial comfort. So be it uh, Rupnagar, be it Shamnagar, be it Vyaspur, it's the topoi or the topography which uh, builds a kind of a comfort for the, uh, for the narrator. And similarly in Lahore, he actually recognizes all these places. So when one is actually uh, displaced from one place, one carries the city with him. That is what uh, Joginder uh, Paul is also saying in Sleepwalkers. You cannot, uh, or, or in Basti also, he's saying it directly that you cannot leave the city behind. You have to carry it with you. Those are in the form of memories, and you always carry that memory with you. Uh, at the end, another site, and they keep piling on, piling up. Uh, Rupnagar, Shamnagar, Yaspur, Lahore. At the end, another site of memory, now one of mourning, 
uh, the Shiraz to get gutted by fire, uh, which had been home for so many and had virtually turned into a heritage site. Uh, I am bearing this uh, term from Pierre Nora's sites of memory. Uh, just as the Taj Mahal or the Imperial Hotel remains sites of memory, so does the house in the Rupnagar. And uh, the room in the terrace that Ammi Jan still thinks remains closed, which holds back certain relics, the heirloom, which is very important because people are crossing border, coming to the uh, new lands, and uh, those second and third generation people will forget about their own uh, grandparents and all. So they have this heirloom, the, the, the entire uh, family history. Written. And that is very coveted, something very coveted, which uh, even uh, what happens with, uh, uh, in uh, sleepwalkers, uh, Divanim al uh, uh brother is also, uh, his finger gets chopped because he stops the thief from taking that chest where the heirloom was there. So this family history or generational history is so very important for those displaced people. Uh, mm, uh, so, uh, yeah. Now, uh, I mean, before his death, Abba Jan hands over to Zakir mold stained Sajjad's prayer. Hakim Nabina's cure for colic pain that worked better than a hundred injections. So, this is in a way countering uh, the Western notion of medicine, which Ashish Nundi uh, deals at length in his books. Uh, that uh, this uh, Hakim Nabina's cure for colic pain that worked better than a hundred injections. A small tablet of earth uh, made out of healing soil of Najaf. Um, the prayer beads that are made of the clay of Karbala and the bunch of keys of the storeroom in Rupnagar. So this becomes a kind of a trust um, with Abba Jan hands over, not property as such, you see, not material things, but memories at, as trust to his own son, to Zakir. Finally, however, Abba Jan, before his own death, makes Zakir a trustee to those memories as if they are property. Just like collective relics, the personal relics too are significant. It's not about just the Taj Mahal or the Imperial Hotel that gets converted into the Taj, fake Taj later on. But these smaller relics also have a great importance, the keys uh, to that room in Rupnagar. Uh, so you, as if you get entry into the world of Rupnagar. And there's this constant metaphor of uh, the gate in uh, Zakir's night walks, that he's confronting the gate. There's a cat, there's a gate, and he's meeting Matt Fakir's uh, just like collective relics, the personal relics who are important, just as history needs to be read alongside individual memory. So along with the uh, bigger totalitarian documented histories, uh, anecdotes and personal histories, memoirs also uh, have great importance. Uh, uh, next topo is Rupnagar, where uh, there is the ground of Karbala, the fort, the black temple and the people tree. And the Ravan Hood. These are the places that Zakir moves around with his uh, own cousins. There were known topographies through which Zakir and his cousins, Bundu and uh, I think it was uh, Habib, uh, uh, used to roam to catch rain bugs. Much later, Zakir recounts the effect of the influence of such epics on his mind. So, this is a kind of an uh, once more synthetic living, see what kind of an effect it has on his mind. That he took the banyan tree to be Ravan uh, in the Ravan forest. So this entire uh, place uh, was relegated beyond the confines of Rupnagar. Amra, uh, when we uh, used to play in our childhood, we used to roam about and go to certain places across uh, one uh, uh, single field and we would enter a slightly different territory where there was this old mansion which was abandoned and we thought that there must have been ghosts inside it. And so uh, that, similarly, they also used to move around in Rupnagar. And, uh, we, I think in Amatil Bhepu, where uh, the Porno comes in and he's thinking about uh, Porno, he's imagining Porno to be there and he's pushing the uh, chariot's wheel and it's stuck in the mud and there's this big, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, the skies are grey and under the grey sky he's imagining uh, Porno. So, uh, childhood uh, romance was something like that about its places and we always had this fear about ghosts in the abandoned house. and. Uh, that is what happened when they went uh, to uh, that Ravan one when, uh, with all his cousins and suddenly they thought that the Banyan tree was Ravan. See, they are all Muslims, but they have such a strong impact on their mind uh, about these epics uh, that he thinks that it is Ravan standing in front of him. And one of his cousins said that he must have heard a sound and uh, someone would pounce on them. So 
they hurriedly ran back home. And as uh, Zakil fell back and had a look at the fort, he felt that he had seen someone standing there. Uh, this is a pure figment of imagination, yet uh, then it had seemed real to him. This was the way he grew up amidst the synthetic culture of Rupnagar and its familiar spaces, the stories of Lord Shiva and Krishna, who had a strong impact on his mind. Surinder too roams the roads of Vyaspur and goes to the a school building which is closed during vacations. Uh, so we come to Vyaspur and Sudinder is more closer to this place. Uh, Zaki too had roamed in Vyaspur, uh, searching for Rinjim. He finds her aged mother. Rinjim is Sudinder's love interest. He finds her aged mother sitting with a half-naked body later on uh, when he goes to uh, Vyaspur and he writes back um, to Zaki in his letter. He says what he had seen. Uh, the mango tree seems to recognize him. But all the Jaman, Neem, and people trees and the birds see him, seem to ask him about the other one, that is Zaki. Where is Zaki? That is Zaki. A place acquires meaning when it is inhabited, inhabited and memories grow. The mango tree uh, that drops a mango seems to recognize him. And yet he feels himself to be a stranger, as if he has lost claim over the space uh, due to his long detachment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is through this kind of living close and uh, living with the commonalities of everyday life that uh, uh, the sense of settlement, uh, that is basti, grows up, where the sense of nation is distant uh, and abstract from such experiences. Even later, uh, those displaced uh, uh, retain identities as, as I was saying, Karnalis and Ambalis um, uh, once they go into Pakistan. Uh, the provincial thus rules over the national. It is Surender who calls Zakir cruel as he does not write to Sabira who is still waiting for Zakir in Delhi. Uh, time is passing fast as there is a mark of a silver here um, in the parting of Sabira's hair. One, others have developed tufts of silver here. When they reach Shamnagar in Pakistan, they cannot see neem trees that would be distinct in India. Afzal, uh, Zakir's uh, poet friend, finds a Persian lilac but those neem trees that would turn green in the monsoons in India are nowhere to be seen. This loss of familiarity makes one feel alien apart from the experiences of displacement and the travails related to it. This sense of alienation is somewhat warded off when Amijan hears the cry of a coel and she begins to feel familiar in Pakistan gradually. Uh, then on another occasion in the house that I was referring, and the two birds, the bulbuls, come to find shelter in the guava tree, who used to pick uh, the ripe guavas, which she used to select for the Japanese, but would never get them. Uh, one uh, uh, ripe ones, much to Amijan's consternation, but the birds fly off as they hear the drones of the airplanes, leaving Amijan crestfallen. It immediately reminds her of her own condition as a refugee, as one who is sheltered, that is, Shoronar. Mm, uh, I'll go to the last section, which is a little longish, uh, uh, which is about the narrative strategy, the history and myth. That much later, when the stories from the Panchatantra or the Jataka tales are told along Dastan kind of stories, which blend with the Kafkaesque metamorphosis in the end, we find the words from the Quran match with the present condition of Pakistan. Mm. Lahore of 1971, Delhi and Jahanabad of 1857 all acquire meaning in a mythic retelling where the mythic country of Kufa, the city that betrayed Imam Hussein, uh, stories of Damascus, where um, Imam Hussein's decapitated head was sent uh, to Yazid, uh, and Jerusalem as deserted cities become one. Uh, the name uh, Zakir, with its Urdu meaning, see, uh, uh, which suggests uh, the witness to Imam Hussein's betrayal, uh, that he was betrayed by the people of Kufa, makes the entire history and its downward spiral more poignant. Uh, uh, certain sayings like, when the rulers, uh, rural, rulers grow cruel and the people lick dust, or when those who can speak fall silent and shoelaces speak, uh, this is what happened when the shoelaces started to start to speak. The wise men inevitably fall silent. Uh, accrue significance as they are applicable in several eras. The condition of any totalitarian state is the same. Where one, when one speaks, one is silenced. 
the decapitated head and the procession of people, uh, headless men, can be related to once more Kufa, I mean the decapitated head of um, uh, Imam Hussein, and also to uh, the totalitarian state where people are gradually silenced, the decapitated head uh, or headless men actually suggest silenced men uh, who don't have the ability to speak in such fascist regimes. Uh, the condition of any totalitarian is the same, where one speaks, when one speaks, one is silenced. Uh, um, uh, the authorities cut the heads and silence the subjects. The silence can be one out of fear. The Dastan-like story of the city of headless people, which is uh, what totalitarian states prefer, is at last confronted by, by the narrator who assumes several personas throughout the narrative, even that of Abul Hassan, popularly known as Hare Bhare Shah, and Amir Hamza from the Thousand and One Nights. So uh, it, it involves this Dastan pattern, where Arabian Nights and Thousand and One Nights a story pattern and that is a kind of narrative storytelling so that one story enters into the other, the other into the other. Uh, uh, so this one story is related to the other and the end, uh, at the end Zaki sees the elongated necks and the flat and stretched out faces of the people, crowd and the troops when he uh, reaches the graveyard of his own father, the heads drop from the trees into the water channel after laughing at him. The narrator checks whether his own head is in its place or not. It is a, a tremendous thing. I mean, he, he realizes that he is in a different world altogether. Another Jataka tale which Buddha told, see uh, how different cultures meet at a certain point. That is what I am also trying to figure out and I am trying to point out as well, uh, that the Jataka, Panchatantra, um, the Quran, they are all similar in some way. Uh, and uh, another Jataka tale which Buddha told to his son Rahul when in one of his births Buddha was a tiger and lived in the foothills of the Himalayas perfectly blends with the words of Quran. When once the tiger roared all the jackals started to howl and wail and the tiger like all wise men uh, for, fell silent as the shoelaces had started to speak. Uh, the other Jataka tale of the sandalwood tree and the goose is related to the partition, and how the single goose is reluctant to leave the burning tree since it had once given him shelter to the other geese had left. So you can very well relate it to one's homeland when it is burning out of riots. Um, there is also this reference to Malvi Matchbox, Malvi Biasli, and he, he is uh, somehow being referred to as one who had actually caused the fire, incinerated the entire city. Uh, so these things can be related and since one is writing since mm, himself i mean uh, basti was being written by uh, intazar hussein in a uh, totalitarian state he had to refer to things obliquely in a nuanced way he couldn't refer to things directly uh, they were said through narratives other narratives i mean uh, through these panchatantra jataka tales and you have to understand what lies beyond it or beneath it uh, since in a totalitarian state nothing can be said directly so he had to adopt this uh, way of narration. Uh, the condition of Pakistan in 1971, when no political discussions were allowed even inside the Shiraz, uh, that is the cafeteria. The several philosophical musings of the Shiva-like yogi sitting under the banyan tree uh, with matted hair, with Nandi the bull to the, to the Raja, uh, the king, who comes to him to seek his advice, or of the Fakir in the city where the elephant and the tortoise, the two brothers fight one another and the city gradually turns into a swamp and then into dust tells us as to why the condition of the city is deteriorating. Since the brothers do not heed the words of their father who had warned him not to claim more beyond their rights. Uh, the story is linked to the two uh, brothers, one Hindu and the other Muslim. So uh, whenever you have this reference to two brothers, you are immediately uh, thinking about Cain and Abel, which features in page number six, uh, and the Hindu and Muslim brother, brother who have fought for separate spaces. And then you have Salamat and Karamat, Malvi, uh, Khwaja Sahib's mm, two sons. Uh, one is the obedient son, and the other is uh, one who has gone astray, uh, Salamat. Karamat being the son-in-law of Batulvi or Khalajan, mother of Tahira. Karamat is married to Tahira. Tahira, 
you all know these details, but I'm giving it for my students. Uh, Tahira being Sabira's sister and stays in Dhaka. And so these people are always thinking about those people in 1971 who had been in Dhaka, who had been in Bangladesh. And uh, as you know about the story about 1971, it was a, a gruesome thing. Number of people were killed, lakhs and lakhs. Uh, don't go by the official documents. The Mukti Bahini was there, um, and um, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, you all know these things and how the Mukti Bahini fought, and they, they were slaughtered. Uh, and ultimately, on 16th December, they earned their freedom in 1971. But uh, in Anam Zakaria's 1971, if you read this you'll find about. Um, here we will find that she is also contesting uh, the uh, official documents uh, and uh, what she has to say uh, in the initial part, how many people actually died. Yes, uh, in Bangladesh as the genocide of 1971, according to several Bangladeshi estimates, 30 lakh people were killed and as many as 2 lakh to 4 lakh women were raped in 1971. And this is the book, 1971, by Anand Zakaria. Uh, it's a beautiful book. Uh, if you need to know about uh, the 1971 part, I mean, over here, you can read it. Uh, when it uh, so uh, uh, the desires, uh, even uh, as I was saying about these brothers, Karamat is married to Tahira. Tahira being Sabira's sister and stays in Dhaka. Sabira, in spite of being a Maldives daughter, takes up a job in Delhi and keeps on waiting for uh, Zakir uh, to come and keep his promise, uh, which he had long ago made to Sabira on the terrace in uh, Vyaspur. The desires are mostly not expressed directly. The grave that both Zakir and Sabira had made for themselves with their uh, legs as molds, they had prepared those gra graves for themselves, uh, had made for themselves uh, when very young is kind of a dream to spend the whole life together. The text ends in a graveyard where Zakir goes to look after the grave of his own father, which had caved in. When it rains, Zakir is reminded of the, I'm moving through these, the text which is moved, which is always moving through associations, not just myths and um, stories, uh, but also an associative pattern is always there. When it rains, Zakir is reminded of the white foot of Sabira, which he had washed after she had molded the grave with her feet. Uh, with it returns the thought of the rain bugs, which he, Bundu, and Habib, his cousins, used to go to catch uh, when they were young. The neem trees, sphinx, rains, and softness of the rain bugs remind Zakir of the wet cheek, soggy hairs, and warm body on the swing, of the softness of the ear lobes, and the lips of Sabira. And with that, we understand that uh, we can refer to the hyacinth girl of uh, T.S. Eliot. So the text moves by way of associations. The, other stories where he moves into the world of the temptations is a world of false promises and false paradise which were generated during the partition. The world of the headless men where the king offers heads uh, of his subjects uh, to the two uh, serpents on his head is the reference to a fascist regime which Pakistan is gradually turning into. There is a procession of headless men at the end. There are riots, mayhem, hail of bullets on the mall road, fire somewhere, and a repetitive pattern of the bricks lying on the road, a burned down bus and upward turned car near the petrol pump and the houses being burned down. See, these are similar things happening in 1971. It happened in Bengal uh, during the Naxalite movement. These are familiar images, 1970s. Uh, the mad fakir of the tomb of Hari Bhare Shah had growled at the person of Zakir who visited the graveyard near the Jama Masjid and had prophesied in 1857 that there would be more such killings. So the persona of Zakir time travels. He goes back as a persona into 1857. He returns to 1947. He goes once more, he comes to the present in 1971. And he's trying to relate things in a very Eliot-esque way, uh, connecting things to things. Uh, so uh, here I see. Uh, the mad fakir of the tomb of Hare Bharisha had growled and, and about 18 years, that there would be more such killings. And that is what ha is happening. And the narrator who is lost in those time tun tunnels, since he knows not how, who he is and where he is or to whom he speaks, says to the fakir that the same things are happening now 
and the fakir roared uh, back at him and drives him away as he uh, returns to the graveyard of his father in the present of 1971 so there are these continuous time swaps and time jumps the narrator feels that it is doomsday there is immense heat when the dead would rise from their graveyards uh, there were corpses then in 1857 in delhi when the emperor was hiding in humayun's tomb emperor bahadur shah zafar you must have read the last mughal uh, yes um dalrim mm, 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 book uh, uh, the narrator feels that it is doomsday and uh, there is a, uh, and uh, and so where uh, the corpses in 1947 onwards near rajghat during partition uh, there is a repetitive pattern of events and hence the text uh though deals with history acquires a mythic tenor uh, just as the people are fleeing bangladesh in 1971 uh, they did in 1947 and so did they do in 1857 the drone of the airplanes uh, in 1971 is similar to the pounding of bombs and the anxiety it spread in 80, in 1965 by the indian airplanes 30 minutes after ceasefire when he says about the wells of jahanabad and that were full of women and the massacre that took place in 1857 it is no less different from what urvashi butalia has to say about the punjabi women who were afraid of being abducted converted and raped in 1947 and hence took the plunge into the well so you know about the story about thoa khalsa the small village where around 80 to 90 women jumped into the uh, well and many um, did not die and their children uh, thought that it was a kind of an honor killing a martyrdom and that is how histories are written and histories are silenced totalitarian history silence these women histories uh, and um, see those uh, when later on this son is narrating this is by way of reference nothing got to do with the text directly uh, uh, he is talking about things he is uh, say he is not mentioning his own mother just because she got saved she did not die because she always hit um, the, uh, the i mean well was not very deep and she always hit the other bodies and she got saved and it became a kind of shame for the son that his mother survived um and uh, you see uh, uh, this kind of entire discourse about about mother uh, about see the kind of a, a discourse about mother or deification of the woman and the imposing of a kind of a metaphor see metaphor always means a kind of an erasure uh, you have uh, something a metaphorical story or Uh, something to say about a woman uh, you erase the body of the woman you put something else something abstract the concept of mother india so everything is always under erasure so uh, the woman becomes mother india and she has to die she has to uh, if she gets abducted she becomes impure because she does not no more remains that pure chaste mother that this pure and impure uh, thing which um, part of that which says about ghore and by the uh, we have this uh, pure and impure a discourse uh, so uh, the, the the real woman is somehow replaced by uh, a fake concept which is imposed on the woman's body and uh, the same thing happens in megatha katara uh, where uh, nita becomes a kind of a jagadhatri or annapurna kind of a deity who has to uh, keep on sacrificing herself for the family's welfare so this is another aspect i don't want to get into it but uh since there is this reference about wells and uh, people's body lying in 1857 in jahanabad same thing happening in 1947 urba shri butalia having said about it i thought i should mention over here such brutalities uh, took place in ice candy man to elevate in the muslim community uh, about uh, the aya shanta mm, the thirst of the children their wailings rape of women had rent the air in all times as a result we find a narrative which takes time jumps there are narrative cuts as the text harks back to several eras from the present and finds a pattern in human suffering it is essentially thus a proctological narrative that focuses on micro histories which thwarts the imposing nature as the totalitarian narratives that assume the kind of objectivity uh, and uses uh, the official language as intizar hussein's text focuses more on personal oral narratives and memoirs as we find the narrator who uh, latches on to the memoir mode uh, when he writes a diary it is uh, some other person there are reference to uh, this diary he, he starts to write diary all of a sudden uh, 
and uh, his uh, when he writes diary it is some other persona that goes back to 1857 uh, and stares at the events then so remember zakir is the witness so he stares at the events then though he writes from the present and his date of 16th december 1971 actually converges with the time of the indian army entering bangladesh and converges to some other happenings that happened in 1857 and analyzes why the revolution had been failed uh, the event of 1971 surely generated a setback among the populace of pakistan uh, since indian leaders never wanted the partition to take place there was crush india uh, written on the cards slogans anguish and riots followed people like salamat and ajmal who are fake communists and had initially supported the revolution of bangladesh had termed those opposing uh, it as uh, reactionaries those who took sides with uh, federal india were uh, imperialist stooges and pro capitalists to them but the defeat at the hands of india took the wind out of their sails and they left for america as no one was willing to own responsibility for the defeat of pakistan there were misinformations all around and no one actually knew what was taking place whether pakistan had actually lost the war no one knew nor wanted to believe in one of those night walks zakir sees a poster and tries to recollect where he had seen it and remembers that he had seen it on the walls of the jama masjid in 1857 so these are time tricks uh, thus histories seem to be overlapping as the narrator gradually loses track of both time and space i quote uh, where am i going in what time in what place every direction confused every place disordered page number 134 uh, uh, it or 1971 as a uh, was a time of complete anarchy and whoever protested could lose his life everyone seemed that the other looked different save himself or herself uh, so now we have a kind of an inward looking history do i have a little more time uh, yes sir you uh, can i speak? okay okay Uh, the narrator uh, reaches several spaces and time to discover similar patterns in history and events. In Delhi, he sees in 1857 how the Persians were supposed to reach Jahanabad. So he's contesting this totalitarian narrative and he's looking inward. Why 1857 Sepoy mutiny failed? How the Persians were supposed to reach Jahanabad to decimate the English Sepoys, but the revolution failed. The Easterners from Meerut. they are busy scavenging jalebis from the snack shops uh, who were supposed to fight that would uh, give their marijuana spike so they were all addicts and they were scavenging for jalebis from the nearby snack shops uh, they are completely oblivious about the explosion that takes place a um, bakht uh, khan who was a fighter uh, is dragged into court politics so he was a man for the battlefield there was a tussle over leadership between mirza mughal and mirza gaus the fight was more for the throne rather than the soul of india the queen of jhansi is already dead as zakir's persona passes the river narbada to meet patia topi who is still carrying on the fight though the battle is lost the empty streets of delhi and the unguarded red fort with the sentry having left has given the city a deserted look however the common men put up a fight with blow pipe sticks and wooden slats from bed frames people stayed within doors with corpses in the same way as zakir and his family had done in the rupnagar when the plague had hit them so there are always these patterns which are emerging the present unrest in lahore merges with the protest in amritsar over the jallianwala bagh massacre when the british had declared curfew and asked everyone to return whatever was looted people put their clothes and jewelry in front of their houses which they had actually stored for their daughter's marriage to avoid the sepoys from entering their home so uh, we find a kind of a permissible nature of history history uh, which is cutting boundaries and time uh, human suffering was always the same uh, hence basti turns out to be a text about the suffering of the common man uh, they had uh, left the city of delhi in droves to save their lives and left their homes hoping to return someday and very soon uh, during partition people in caravans set out for unknown destinations on the way they got mobbed robbed and abducted when they reached the other side of the border more than the stories of persecution the tales they told were about nostalgia their love for the land they had left the empty evacuated houses 
seemed as if its occupants had left for a pilgrimage and would soon be back, leaving everything intact. On reaching the promised land, they were left disillusioned as they had no shelter, though they had large houses in their homelands. They had to bribe the corrupt officials to gain shelter. If Afzal's grandmother um, uh, and several others who eventually reached Pakistan and tried to settle down in Pakistan had their narration of woes, so did Mullah Binotia. Uh, Binot being an Indian form of martial art, which uh, this person, Mullah Binotia, had used against the marauders while crossing the border. The story regarding Malvi matchbox, which I was referring, is haunting, who sits with the empty matchbox, uh, suggestive of the deserted cities, and the Malvi himself might be the one who had instigated the process of the incineration of the city. Uh, these stories frame the narrative of Basti than just feeling to be uh, objective like a historian. Uh, Intizar Hussain shows how memory and history are intertwined. The larger official discourses influence the personal ones, and so do those narratives based on memory act as counter-narratives to history. Since history is written from a subjective standpoint, ideologized, and is often divided on the religious lines, and hence is partisan. 1970 was, uh, 71 was no different either. As Anam Zakaria points out, in 1971 too, Khwaja Sahib, Malvi Sahib, and his Abba Jan, uh, that is Abba Jan, Ammi Jan, all are restless to get news about Batulbi, Tahira, and Karamat. People escape Bangladesh and leave for the forests of Nepal, just as the queen and the young prince had left in 1857 for the forests of Nepal. Many crossed borders in Burma and Rangoon to make their way back to Pakistan, since they were no more citizens of the undivided Pakistan. East Pakistan gained independence in 1971 and became Bangladesh. Sorry, the plight of the common men had always been the same. During the war, people left Lahore and cities in Pakistan for elsewhere for safety. In 1857, common men were ready to fight the British with flats of bed, blowpipes, and rods, whereas the soldiers and the sentry with guns and cannons had left their posts. Thus, the novel is also post-colonial since it questions any monolithic stance to the past and, as an insider, interrogates past events. Looking back at the past, resurrecting the ghosts only to put them in their proper place after viewing it in its totality. I'm using beloved over here, uh, raising and resurrecting the ghosts. Uh, the narrative in particular is careful to point out to other forms of destruction owing to war. Uh, cities are bombarded, relics are destroyed, owing to globalization and corporatization other than war. Though such relics are part of a nation's cultural heritage. Uh, uh, so uh, once more I'm referring to Pierre Nora's, uh, where the sites and the, uh, their dynamics matter. I mean, how they stay uh, uh, in circulation or certain uh, sites of memory are relegated uh, is very important. Such sites are part of collective memory, and the individual memory is also a part of the collective memory making, uh, as Morris Holbox uh, points out in on collective memory. Um, so uh, there is this kind of a symbolic manifestation of a, a site of memory, where uh, we practice certain things over and over again. Um, um, then uh, see gallantry, use of the words like gallantry or uh, dying for one's fatherland, these are the phrases used, and a certain day becomes important, and we celebrate certain days at the expense of others, and those are the histories which are being erased constantly, uh, just as the sites of memory, uh, certain sites, I mean, uh, doing this thing on a very symbolic basis uh, each year, or uh, uh, and it becomes shivling under the banyan tree, it, it gains importance, and it becomes a site of memory. I mean, uh, it becomes important. Uh, so this is a very gross example. Just as the uh, personal narratives are part of the collective, similarly, nationalist discourses influence. I, I was actually mentioning about uh, uh, here about Taj Mahal and the Imperial Hotel, uh, and even the Shiraz, which actually became sites of memory for them. And these actually get erased gradually. Uh, through bombing, once there is bombing, uh, certain uh, relics, heritage sites get erased, which take years to become heritage sites, and they become important for a natural, uh, for a, for a nation and its culture. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. 
uh, uh, just as the personal narratives are part of the collective, similarly, nationalist discourses influence our individual oral tellings of the past. In Meghet Hakatara, we find that the family unit is representative of the social and the national unit, and the nationalist discourse formation, as Paulo Michoprovorti points out in The Refugee Woman, uh, must be. Uh, we select uh, certain days to commemorate and we leave out certain others. Uh, those selected then become part of the nation's a totalitarian discourse and that is the authoritative and documented narrative about the nation. Memory is inevitably uh, related to a, a process of forgetting as certain sites are discarded and certain days and events are suppressed because uh, history is all about prioritizing things, about uh, hierarchizing things, I mean certain events and certain others are repressed because in the process of employment uh, of beginning, middle and end, we often introduce certain things which are fantastic and that's why Intizar Hussein is also deliberately using these fantastic things about the Dastan pattern is being introduced into the narrative pattern. Uh, because history also does that while writing subjective histories, the historian takes those liberties and um, ideologizes things and he does um, put certain things and highlights certain things at the expense of certain other events. Uh, uh, Anam Zakaria, Urvashi Butalia, uh, so memory is inevitably related to process of forgetting um, certain days, yes. Now, Anam Zakaria, Urvashi Butalia, Ritu Menon and Kamla Bhasin, this favor oral histories over the official ones. In Basti too, there is an attempt at destroying the mausoleum of uh, Hare Bhare Shah and his Armenian dis disciple uh, Sarmat Shah um, uh, to build offices or the imperial hotel destroyed in Pakistan to build the Taj Mahal, which would never be able to match the original heritage site. Uh, such loss of heritage sites are loss of cultural spaces meant to commemorate a particular form of history. Uh, with the destruction of the imperial hotel and era passes away of the cabaret dancer, Miss Dolly, and the post-partition gentry, uh, sophisticated in ways and manners, who get replaced by ruffians at the end. Uh, a lone couple is seen dancing and one or two people sipping tea. Uh, this reminds about Jol Shakar. Uh, decadence uh, has set in in Pakistan. Uh, some, someone must have lured away Miss Dolly in the process. Intizar Hussein points out in Basti how the destruction of sites happen due to war. Though such heritage sites take years to acquire the, uh, the form of a relic that is woven with uh, loss and nostalgia, years of dropping of birds, sun and the rain, that sites weather, turn them into heritage sites. Uh, the narrative successfully mixes the real and the fantastic, thereby questioning the entire basis of what we may call the quote-unquote real. Uh, in the Dastan pattern, there is reference to one uh, lady in green who appears from nowhere stops the sepoys and then vanishes into the air. Two unrecognizable voices discuss this in the city. The text harbors multiple voices. These are the elitist voices in the city, just as the authentic newspaper, quote unquote authentic newspaper, uh, spreads fake news that Agra and the Taj Mahal has been destroyed. Similarly, Khwaja Sahib is not so sure and yet reports about the seventh fleet of America to have entered the Bay of Bengal. Since then, the Russian army had sided with India in 1971. The scooter cab driver uh, in Lahore remarks that the Chinese are good at battle at night time. And Zakir is privy to these conversations which come to him in the form of uh, form as snippets as he walks the streets of Lahore. And thus the real and the fantastic constantly get woven into one another. There is also the story of his legendary uncle, uh, Khan Bahadur of Yaspur, who had a silver leg and was instrumental in nabbing the silk handkerchief gang which had plotted against the British to overthrow them from power. Just as these voices, other voices grow in prominence, Zakir as the narrator loses significance and receives rhythm. He does not know who he is or where he is, the confusion and restlessness, where am I? Words said where, by whom, stories told when, my brain is seething like a cooking pot over the fire. This is the condition of the narrator. The narrator loses significance in history. The choric voice infiltrates the narrative. Often uh, it's the poet Mir who is saying, you murdered and then you were murdered. You exiled and then you were exiled. This reminds us of the choric voice in Eliot's that promised to show in a handful. He responds to his mother's voice. Often he keeps answering, 
to unknown voices inside his head zaki desires to fall asleep and so does afzal uh, inside a cave for 700 years and desire to wake up in a changed world uh, i move to the last section very last section uh, the narrative is in fact never mentions the names of gandhi jinnah nehru or patel and hence is more insistent on discussing the spiritual and mental condition of the masses and their history uh, through memories that get prioritized uh, instead the text shows how patterns of suffering had kept on occurring from time to time and at the end there is the reference to doomsday as zakir hides inside the graveyard the graveyard becomes a cave unto him as there is smoke since riot is going on uh, before dying abba jan had instead of straightening one's clothes before one desires to leave that is one should not have too many fineries and wealth for which the mind would remain pensant abba jan had also said in rupnagar when there was plague that uh, that if one tries to escape death death would surely catch up with him he repeats the same when people are leaving the city in 1971 it seems like an incantation forbidding zakir to quit one's own soil Uh, the figure of the shiva and that of krishna keep on recurring uh, the figure of krishna is evoked as one who has come down from his chariot and broken his foot on the pitcher uh, uh, that is the pitcher of milk butter and innocence and gone into the forest to search for his brother uh, he is the protector uh, who has left the city uh, who has left uh, and gone into the forest and so the um, city uh, is in trouble the other brother is lord shiva who had gone uh, who had spoken to the king in the middle of the story and delivered his sermons how to search peace is now once more inside the forest with matted hair sitting on the deer skin as a snake appears through his mouth and merges into the ocean suggestive all the vices poison that en- get unleashed on earth as the yogi goes breathless spelling a kind of a sure doom shiva nil control and the snake in the form of a vice is coming out of his mouth and going into the ocean the waters cannot be contained any more see once more it is the effect of the synthetic culture that has on intezar husain the waters cannot be contained any more as the waves engulf the holy city of dwarka where the yadavas are engaged in civil war at the end when there will be civil war and the doomsday will happen uh, it is referring to that portion the sermon of bhishma to yudhishthira uh, on the battlefield of the maharashtra uh, sorry in the battlefield of the mahabharata is heard who says that in the beginning uh, there was water and in the end too everything will perish in water and he utters om shanti 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 that the yogi had previously said to the king in the middle of the text to search for peace zaki too searches for peace thus the crisis is not just in europe as eliot's poem refers to om shanti Uh, but uh, in the east as well uh, so with this i end my paper uh, i would like to just read out a little bit of a section a uh, very small per, uh, part uh, page 203 uh, at the end when afzal calls all of them cruel zaki remembers of surender calling him the same in his letter and tells to irfan that he wants to write a letter to sabira before it is too late and he explains before the parting of her hair fills with silver and the birds fall silent so all these have been already referred to in this text of silver here the birds quail and bulbul birds fall silent and before the keys rust is to the house in rupnagar and the doors of the streets are shut and before the silver cord is loosed and the golden bowl is shattered this is a brilliant image and the pitcher is broken at the well pitcher flute and pitcher uh, at the well and the sandalwood tree and the snake in the ocean and dot 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 uh, i end my paper over here and if you have any comments no threatening questions i know very little uh, as much as i knew i tried to deliver so please uh, if you give me a small break i mean uh, two minutes sure sir sure. Sure. Yeah, sure yeah 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 thank you sir for such an enriching lecture now i would like to ask the participants to come up with their queries if there are any you can also post your queries 
in the chat box. Shri Ardhi Pankar. You are requested to fill up the feedback form. Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, Deepankar? Yeah. Deepankar, you can come up with your query. Good evening, sir. Yes. I'm Deepankar. And okay, it's a you. pleasure yes. to get the opportunity to ask the question, sir. Basically, okay. I, would, uh, I would like to ask two questions, sir, if you are mm -hmm. comfortable. Sir, uh, yeah. sir, uh, you mentioned Rabindranath's universal flag of flagnessness. So, yeah. sir, do you believe that this flag does terminate the orthodox religious identity of being Hindu and Muslim and the national identity of Indian and Pakistani? Mm. Mm, not really. Not really. Uh, it's very difficult. Things have gone uh, to such an extent, I mean, it's really not possible. It's more uh, utopian and idealistic. And that's why it comes in the form of a poem. Hmm. And sir, do you believe that, sir, uh, this flag is too heavy to bear because it's <laughs> next to impossible to resist the yeah. pseudo-national sentiments? Like, yeah. I am Indian and I must hate Pakistan. Because mm. this type of hate runs in our country right now, sir. Yeah, it does run. But there are good films. There are... Uh, other things which actually help us to think in a different way, uh, to become more accommodative, to more become more perceptive to things. Uh, I'm not completely against it, but yes, uh, lines are drawn. There are people who are um, in power who actually like to see things in certain ways uh, where, uh, I mean, there will be situations which won't come to terms with the grassroots level existence where people actually think uh, in terms of Lokshi Pachali or staying together, staying in the same village as Hindus, Muslims, Pakistan. It did happen amongst people. But now when uh, people think about nations and religions, a nation in terms of religions, then it becomes very difficult. I do understand. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So it's all about mindset. I mean, the kind of films you will make, uh, that will also have an impact. If you make a gather and you say, uh, Khun Mango or Back Mango and Chir Ke Dunga, 
then it becomes very difficult. And when you think about certain sober things about people who are made of similar cultural uh, sites, similar cultural uh, things, and we is, have the same kind of an uh, longingness and belongingness, uh, then things become different. But if you insist too much on religion and religious uh, differences, uh, then it becomes difficult. Yes. I mean, you have to select areas where you want to stress. Yeah. Anything else, anyone? Uh, this the organizers uh, supposed to answer. And Okay, but there is one question from Dhiman Roy. How can you yeah. interpret uh, Salamat's decision to reject the scholarship offer from America in Basti? Is there any political connotation? Mm, mm, see, I think uh, what happens is uh, why Salamat came back to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, back to Pakistan. And the thing is uh, somewhat. Uh, if I'm allowed to say, I mean, what happened with the Naxalites? Many moved out from India, from Bengal to Pakistan, from uh, to Oxford and several other places. They are very big names also, but uh, they do found that the position of the communists was uh, challenged, or they were thinking about things in these terms that they uh, were somewhat a kind of a failure, and that's why they left and they. Came back. I mean, those who are committed uh, to some kind of an ideology or something, uh, it's a different thing with them. Otherwise, if you are fake, then uh, as Salamat does, he returns and uh, preaches religion, and he's a drunkard. Uh, we need to keep these things also in mind. He goes to America. He calls people America's stooge, uh, capitalist stooge, but he himself does not uh, differ while uh, thinking about leaving for America. He does it immediately and comes back once more uh, in different guises, in different times. These people are always suspect. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. yes uh, Rumana Parveen, you can ask your question now. Good afternoon, sir, for such an yes. interesting session. Uh, sir, what I want to say is that in partition narratives, particularly in Intisar Hussain's Basti, uh, we see that Zakir became a professor in Pakistan. He made yeah. new friends and uh, he used to uh, talk to them and used to go to the Shiraz and uh, talk to them uh, regarding uh, the matters on politics or the things happening around him. And also, mm. we have seen in uh, the shadow lines, in Amitabha Ghosh's shadow lines, that Thamma, uh, she became a uh, teacher and then a head headmistress. She lived her entire life uh, with her work and family, and she hadn't got time to remember her desh or uh, native land. So can we say that the trauma of displacement didn't hit people just after the partition, rather the people who came across the border were busy to settle in the new country and then after a certain age, in a certain point of their life, they started illusioning things, they started uh, longing for their native land? Mm, this is a very interesting question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I do agree with you. Uh, initial uh, days when there was persecution, people actually want to cover it up with a kind of a nostalgia, those stories. Uh, they relegated that persecution part and they uh, were bent on uh, I mean, uh, narrating tales about uh, their uh, nostalgia for the place. And they settled down, but they were always trying to, as you rightly said, they were trying to settle down actually and adjust hope with those uh, areas and uh, they were in uh, in search for a uh, search of job and shelter, and after getting that, after a considerable amount of time, and they do romanticize to a certain extent, to a large extent, and I remember those places and do try to go back. Um, yeah, um, to uh, a certain sir, extent, imaginatively as well. Yeah. 
Hello. If you allow me, I would like to add something. Uh, as Rumana yes. is asking, uh, it reminds yeah. me of the very idea of a belatedness of trauma. As uh, you know, uh, 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 it was uh, talked about by uh, Kathy Carruth in her book Unclaimed mm. Experiences, one of the mm. major exponents mm. of trauma studies. So I f- also feel that this whole idea of the belatedness of trauma can mm. also, be, you know, uh, brought in here to. to understand what uh, rumana is asking basically right? mm, yeah 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 true, true sir uh, also in the memo ar doya moir kotha sunanda shikdar also started writing the memo ar in her old age uh, while uh, she was probably 60 and she also mm. started with the line i don't uh, particularly remember but that line but uh, she started saying that uh, as i write uh, my uh, my sorrows disappear uh, and all these i don't remember the particular line though uh, so she also didn't think of the past in her entire life but in old days she started reminiscing those okay thank you i'll note it down and i'll go through these things thank you so much Uh, this, this was an addition. May I, may I uh, just uh, uh, see a few uh, a few things about it? Oh That's, yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Please, uh, I, I, I want to keep silent. Please go on. It was yes, very yes. nice. It's a pleasure. To, very nice to listen to you, uh, because you. you spoke about the river of blood, the sixth river, and the partition. People yeah. changing religion for mm-hmm. the sake of, uh, of uh, love of the country. Uh, it mm-hmm. was wonderful to hear you uh, could Thank relate you. it very well uh, mm-hmm. but what rumana asked with uh, that was also a very interesting question i think yeah. that uh, yeah. the people who left uh, uh, purbo pakistan or mm-hmm. pushim pakistan west mm-hmm. pakistan mm-hmm. right um uh, there was so much they had to struggle so much initially <coughs> the initial mm-hmm. struggle was so great that they, they couldn't have written something mm-hmm. uh, only after they got settled Yeah. Uh, the trauma came out, and writing is a kind mm. of purgation. Writing yeah. is basically purgation. It's not hobby. Yeah, true, true. It was purgation for true. them, and so when they were writing, they were actually getting purged. Mm. Uh, Best person to say about, about writing. Yeah, question. they were getting purged, and they, at that point of time, they were rather settled. Settle yeah. down to write. When you have to write, you first have to eat something. And when they came mm-hmm. to uh, the India as the refugees, they didn't have the shelter. They didn't have food. So how could they write? That was true, true, true. unspeakably traumatic. Uh, yeah. It was only after uh, not exactly settlement, but uh, after uh, uh, after they got over, over a certain phase of trauma. we could write i f- mm-hmm. think so because uh, i've experienced it and uh, among many people and all the age of course you. is associated with reminiscing mm-hmm. but it was wonderful to listen to because you were such a you, uh, so you, you your uh, 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 lectures are so to the point and yet uh, they have vast ranges thank you very mm-hmm. much so you Ma'am, are, uh, if, if you if you allow me i mean uh, for the sake of the, the students over here can i just uh, read out a little bit from intizar hussain's personal account i mean this i do want to actually uh, otherwise uh, i will feel bad if i don't do this uh, there is a fine visualization of indian culture uh, by intizar hussain that the religions of india drew upon that the relig- uh, india drew upon a di- diverse variety of mythic sources when rememorializing his childhood during his conversation with me that is alok bhalla alok bhalla was in conversation uh, the name of the book was uh, is partition dialogues um, where he says as as is often the case in small basties very interesting photo like to suno our terrace merged with the terraces of other homes and i am actually reminded of my own childhood our terraces merged with the terraces of other houses inhabited by hindus i could always walk across uh, from the terrace of our house to those of our hindu neighbors during diwali for instance it was difficult to tell if the diyas were lit on the parapet of our house or on that of our hindu neighbors as a child i would climb to the terrace of our house and gather as many diyas as i could the next morning i would count the number of diyas i had picked up so beautifully said and i felt like sharing this with you all yes You must mm-hmm. and uh, I remember a story by Chukta Isma Chukta when the bolum, bolum. Uh, Hindu uh, uh, boy and the Mus- uh, Muslim girl uh, they are mm. friends and they fall, uh, they fell in love and um, mm-hmm. 
uh the boy says i become a muslim during the eid and during the holy i become a hindu so that was a kind mm-hmm. of relationship they were having yes uh, yes ma'am. wonderful <laughs> yes beautiful, beautiful. Oh, there are other questions too from students in golputa namte ek to bolte parben madam ha ami na ami acha amake bole deben pore i made a script What's out of it uh, oh okay okay so, so, so don't dive don't dive <laughs> uh in malda as well as in kolkata okay, actually okay, i great, great. Uh, put the name as mm-hmm. apna mahalla it was in hindi mm. uh, uh, mm. uh actually broken hindi you can say the kind of hindi uh, mm-hmm. people, people in mm. kolkata speak uh, mm. i will get you the name of the boy was pushkar and the name of the girl was okay. shabnam that i remember but mm. <laughs> i've forgotten the okay. Na- okay. title of the story i'll get it get it to you okay okay yes uh anything else if not then i'll read one more section if you allow me sure if people are really not in a hurry this this small part i mean uh, this is uh, from dekh kabira roya from sadat hasan mantu <clears throat> who records through the eyes of the uh, great saint poet kabir the spiritual ruin of lahore after 1947 kabir wanders through the city and weeps at the vandalism of the past corruption of the present but also at the signs of a merciless future that the exiled migrants will have to face in pakistan and india the historical poet kabir believed that his songs were spiritual dialogues with other men and god in the fictional text however the people kabir meet in lahore obscure the distinction between words and daggers uh, it's more insistent on the language part and confuse their passion for slogans with thought kabir regrets realizes the uh, regrets and realizes that beauty is no longer an attribute of god and that language no longer honors man the migrants he realizes uh, realizes who have taken over the city desire nothing but wealth and power while he the visionary poet has inherited only a soulless city uh, everyone he goes to he finds men uh, wherever he goes he finds men betray each other and curse the day they were born and i come to the section in particular one day this fictitious fictitious kabir kabir is moving through the city sees a vendor tearing pages from a book of religious poems by surdas to make paper bags when a weeping kabir prevents the vendor saying that the papers that have the poems of bhagat surdas on them should not be used to make paper bags the vendor replies a man who is named surdas can never be a bhagat bhagat saint the vendor's taunt is made up of a foul pun on the word sur uh, which is uh, sanskrit uh, which in sanskrit means melody harmony and also an angel or god but when slurred over it becomes sur or suar pig in punjabi dekh kavira roya from dastavez another day kavir finds a beautiful statue of the goddess lakshmi covered with straw people tell him our religion does not permit idol worship Uh, with tears in his eyes kavi retorts no religion teaches one to be face beautiful things but people merely laugh at him yeah yes done sir actually uh, i think uh, uh, this uh, intizar husain in one of his uh, interviews commented that he didn't know anything mm-hmm. about uh, monolithic islamic culture that this uh, pakistan mm-hmm. uh, Pol- Pakistan political uh, Pakistani political leaders were uh, trying to impose. Mm. He was talking about uh, Indian Islamic culture. I think even in Bosti, mm. it is actually mm. a confluence of different cultures and religions uh, yeah. uh, of the sure, subcontinent. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. This is something that uh, this Bosti is uh, Bosti is also trying to portray. And uh, yeah. you commented on uh, you, you talked the, you defined this uh, memorial as a sort of topoi, right? Hello, sir. Mm-hmm. no not not really so, I, so I, I, i was i was uh what Sorry. i didn't get it i didn't get it uh, you were talking about topo area i think topo okay. yeah areas spaces geographical spaces through which okay uh, where he moves zakir moves that is uh, rupnagar maybe shamnagar maybe vyaspur in lahore so those okay. spaces become comfort zone for him and he imbibes okay, those spaces he inherits those spaces and he carries those spaces with him and yes you have rightly pointed out about uh, what you were saying that he does not take any particular political stance or ideological stance or uh, any kind of uh, 
partisan thing is uh, not prevalent in his work on Basti, and that's why uh, it did not uh, amuse many people. And uh, even Francis W. Pritchett, I'm uh, quoting from Asif Farooqi's uh, introduction, uh, other critics of the book, as Hussein's translator, Francis uh, W. Pritchett, had noted, complained that the novel offered a negative impression of their culture, a mood of nostalgia. But then, as Pritchett sensibly remarks, surely no intelligent reader will expect the book to be a definitive, complete picture of modern Pakistan. Finally, the novel's unconventional form led some aesthetically conservative critics to wonder if it was a novel at all. Mm. Uh, in particular, critics attacked, attached to a politically activist concept of literature were disappointed at Zakir's ineffectuality, objecting that the book offered no clear political perspective or resolution, though that, of course, was the point. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, about Richard, as I said. Thank you, sir. It is more about the crisis of uh, the spiritual crisis of man that he is trying to uh, show about any refugee as such. He is not taking any political line. That's right. yeah. So, is there any other query? So, I suppose we do not have any. So, I would like to now request uh, our AKMM to deliver the vote of thanks. I would like to thank everybody for their patience. Thank you so much. Thank you thank for you being so here much, so long. Thank you so much. Yeah. And the Anuradha Madam, she is a fabulous person. I don't have words for her. I mean, inviting me, this is a, thank you so much man, for giving me this platform. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajabasu, assistant professor and head of the Department of English, uh, Sri Chaitanya College. Wonderful speaker. I first of all thank Dr. Manush Kumar Boiddo, uh, Principal Malda College, uh, for allowing us and enthusing us to organize this webinar series. I am thankful to all the students, and I must pay my thanks to uh, Jyoti Irmoy, Obhoy, Arathrika, and all the other faculty members. And uh, I hope. The students have enjoyed because it's very important to know partition literature. They have no, they, they have no direct contact with partition, but the power past is always there in the present. I do believe that. So it's very important to read partition literature to feel. And what I, I essentially felt uh, last year also and this year too that when Raja, uh, he speaks out, uh, the speakers should speak out with passion. That needs a, a, a great deal of concentration and dedication which is enormously found in Dr. Basu's speech, his lecture. So thank you once again. And uh, I hope the students will get their feedbacks soon. And uh, I, 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 I'm yeah. thankful to everybody, that I must say. I, it was also a learning experience for me for, uh, because of the, all the comments and every other thing. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, sir, so, for being with us. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We shall yeah. be looking forward to hearing from you in the future as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, so may I leave? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sure. Okay. Thanks a lot. So, this is how today's session ends. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation. Thank you. Abhay, just uh, tell the students to join the uh, webinar on 30th also. It's, uh, I think, right. the students. So, well. Today, the students have left, actually. Which I felt very bad about it. I don't know uh, whether there was internet problem. Or, uh, I don't think so. There was internet problem, but uh, right. so many students Not left. Internet. Actually, this is very embarrassing for the faculty. Very right. embarrassing for the department. At, at least, if you don't join, join don't join. But... They're leaving in the midst of the lecture. That is uh, not expected. Please do mention that. Okay, so uh, for those who are still with us now, we have already shared the poster regarding the webinar we have on 30th this month. So all are requested to join positively. And we will obviously counting we will be counting you know the students who are actually attending these lectures and who are not so 
be careful this is what at this moment i am supposed to say once again thank you for your active participation